good morning everybody thank you for inviting me today um i do apologize i am in work today so i apologize for the background um but as i say i do think very visual and um, just a little note on that i am happy for carla to share my twitter account um with everybody if anyone wants to follow me um but just to be aware it is my personal account as well so if you don't like cats you'll see a lot of oscar um, and you'll also see a lot around kindness, integrated work and things like that. So please do follow if you want to, but just a cautionary, there'll be lots of Oscar popping up on a weekend. Um, <laughs> so thank you for inviting me today. Um, just a little bit of a background about myself. So I am a project manager. I work with Warrington Together. Um, and my um, work involves the development of the integrated um, community teams. Um, however, although my title is a project manager, my background is clinical in the health. So I qualified as a district nurse back in 2001, um, whereas one of the first community staff nurses to come straight out into the community and work within the Leeds Community Healthcare Trust then. Um, I moved in 2007 to Warrington um, and then I undertook my district nursing qualification at Chester University. Um, over the years, I um, came more and more out of clinical practice, really, um, saw the challenges on a clinical perspective um, with silo working, um, integrated working, um, have a very strong value set, really, around kindness, supporting each other, um, often sometimes at the detriment of myself as well. I spent a lot of time working long, long hours. Um, and I came to a point really where I realized that I couldn't sustain um, what I was doing for much longer. And I also had um, tipped a point with my values really around my role modeling. Um, because although I was very eager to support my teams to go home on time, I wasn't role modeling that myself and was working till nine, ten o'clock at night um, to try and support those teams, which promoted me really into this role around integrated working um, within Warrington, which opportunistically came up at a very similar time. Um, so I've been in post now for the last two years in September, which have absolutely flown by. Um, but what I've come today to talk about is kind of the journey today around integrated working, but specifically looking at some of those barriers or possibly um, opportunities around that data sharing. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if anyone knows um, Warrington. Warrington has a population of approximately around 200,000 and it's located ideally um, just between Manchester and Liverpool. Very good for housing if anyone's thinking about moving. Um, very good motorway links. Um, but with that comes um, quite a difference really with a very, very deprived pocket within Warrington with um, more out uh, areas becoming very affluent, which from a health perspective, um, quite shockingly, and I think quite upsettingly, um, sees a 12 year difference in life expectancy in Warrington um, between our most affluent and our most deprived areas. Um, so Warrington Together was a programme that was dedicated to looking at that integrated working um, with healthcare and um, social care, but also including those community third sector and voluntary services. So you can see where this presentation is going really. With health and social care, we have our barriers around information sharing, and then we bring in our community third sector wider partners with those um, voluntary sectors as well. Um, it is focused on an integrated model, very much on a place-based perspective as well, so very much looking at building with our communities around us in Warrington. So the development of integrated community teams, as I say, was focused on that integrated working. So closer to home, um, all the government initiatives that we hear around care closer to home, health and social care located within our communities, and working more to a um, seamless point of um, care. So I'm sure there are a number of us, probably all of us on this call, who have had to tell our story a number of times um, often to the point that we either miss data um, ourselves because we've told our story that time or we become very very frustrating um, 
and I would imagine the majority of us on this call are very independent and can very speak for our own rights. Um, so when we um, look at our most vulnerable population who often can't do that, we can understand how challenging that sharing of that information is around that seamless or very silo working at the moment. So there's just a little photo next of our um, integrated teams. Um, this was pre-COVID, so that's why we're not social isolating, just for a disclaimer there on the photos. Um, but how we developed some of that integrated working with a place-based um, model. So you, you can't really see from uniform, which from a health perspective is one of the very um, outstanding things around you know that you're talking to somebody in health because they generally have a uniform on and um, but in the photos there you can see that there's a mixture of health social care and also our third sector and um, voluntary services as well sitting within a co-located area to try and develop those key relationships oh we've gone backwards <laughs> sorry about that um, so just a little brief of why we looked really at developing that integrated working um, and predominantly it was, um, we talk about this in health quite a bit, um, we talk about putting people in the centre of everything that we do um, and fundamentally it was around bringing those teams together to make sure that we benefit from that communication and relationships building. It was looking at that proactive management as well. Sometimes those um, little gut instincts that people get when they go meet somebody and they think something's not quite right. Often because of some of our barriers with um, information sharing, you often don't share at those early stages. Whereas bringing people together, you will often have um, what we talk about when I first qualified in district nursing, but those corridor conversations. So those conversations in handover. It was supporting people to live as independently at home as possible and also to support people to access some of that support themselves as well. So initially across Warrington, we looked at developing multidisciplinary teams. Um, we had a um, few transformational events so where we brought people together in the same room. Um, and although we have very robust referral processes across Warrington, um, what was, I suppose, surprising to some people was people had actually never met people from those wider services. And this is where the challenge came really around our information sharing, because although initially um, we wanted to have health, social, our third sector and our voluntary services all around the table as very, very key partners, what we um, identified within Warrington was initially there was actually no data sharing agreement for us to share that information around patients um, and our population. So what we did initially was we brought people together and didn't talk about patient identifiable information, but we talked about scenarios around what was our agreed outcomes that we wanted to deliver um, so that we could start to change that mindset of people um, while working in the background around some of our actual um, specific patient information sharing. And what we agreed on was um, that we wanted the um, care to be patient centred. We wanted the ownership as well, because what we'd found across the system when we um, spoke to a lot of our services was people didn't really take ownership. So we were expecting people to take ownership of their own health and social care needs. But as services, what we often didn't do was then take ownership of those referral pathways had quite a lot of exclusion criteria rather than inclusion criteria across the system. Fundamentally, as I'm sure on a lot of um, people that are on the call today of your projects that you're working on, um, our hospital was central to this and reducing those hospital admissions. So making sure that the um, acute beds were open for those acute needs as well. And also developing relationships um, it often isn't what you know, but it's who you know as well, how you can start that conversation. Um, so some of those challenges, as I say, that we saw initially at the beginning, um, 
I say unfortunately, but um, there are often some of the challenges still now, even though we're continuing two years down the road with a further development of integrated working, is different systems. Um, now, it might be a surprise to some people um, that even within healthcare across Warrington, like many systems out there, we have a number of IT systems that we use within health. We also then have a different system that we use within social care, and we also have different systems that we use with our third sector and voluntary services. So it's around looking at opportunities of how can we share that data? How can we make sure we protect that data so we're not sharing it inappropriately, but also so that we're not stopping people from having the best opportunity and making that biggest difference to our system. Bearing in mind that in the back of my mind all the time and with people that are involved in this work is that 12 year life expectancy um, difference, which is um, literally a mile either way down the road. So what we looked at is um, data sharing um, agreement. So we looked at a um, system wide data sharing agreement and included primary care um, within that data sharing agreement so that fundamentally our core data initially within Warrington was all held on your primary care record held by GPs um, and it was around changing some of that outdated mindset as well I don't know if you've talked about this Cal or have you but often as barriers people can um, say we can't we can't share that information because it's a data breach or yeah. when actually when we look at it i mean covid um if anything positive has come from covid it, it has helped us with that data sharing and how we can really support people um especially our most vulnerable population i don't know have you had any feedback Carla, as a group around some of that mindset change initially as well yeah i think um initially when we've been chatting about it in in our first session last year it was it was spoken about that it was with felt like it was the uh, withholding of information that was stopping them from moving forward um so things like even patients not being able to access their own information at times um that would be really valuable we spoke about um digital apps that you can use as patients but again that um does exclude some people that aren't savvy with technology and don't know their own information um, but that repetitiveness especially when it comes to end of life care was mentioned you know how difficult that is then um, and how sort of it, it eats away into precious time at that certain stage of somebody's life so again it goes back to data really affecting the quality of care patients are getting because um, it's being held up with other things we also um, in, in um, sort of past accounts from the innovation scouts have heard about you know how um, it's stopping people from spending time more on their job anyway and um, so that they feel that they're constantly duplicating things that they're doing because they're trying to gather more information but as Lynn mentioned before that's only sort of the smaller picture whereas potentially if they knew with artificial intelligence had some sort of algorithm of data where they could expect certain things to happen as you say you know where does that get shared do I mean it's interesting you say about the life expectancy of those in Warrington do the people within that area know that they are less likely to um, die 12 years earlier than and people in the other postcode do they actually know that information um, and and for me personally just reading um, the covid um, keeping up with that at the moment i've seen I, I, i'm actually from st Helens, and i've seen that our poorest areas have got the highest r rate of covid and our more affluent areas so we can see that not only was it affecting you know current health issues at that time you know it's now spilt over into this real um pandemic that's just you know horrendous isn't it and how 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 are we collecting data on that now and you know that's i think that's being shared more widely than other uh, long-term illnesses you know we seem to be getting a lot more data on health inequalities around covid than anything else so it does tell me that we can do that and i'm hoping that working virtually now and with the innovations that you know are, are developing across that in terms of like patient outpatient appointments you know uh, virtual 
um, sessions with GPs and nurses and, uh, you know, health and, and, and charity and, and even for university, maybe we can capture data a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, we, we've discussed data and it is a, a big factor, as Lynn said, around artificial intelligence, you know, how do we actually capture that? It goes back to that shirt occur. So, you know, if patients donated their data, what would we know? Um, and um, yeah, so um, I've just got a few on the chat actually, Sarah, it's Sarah. So Sarah Marshalls, but she lives in Warrington and the 12 year gap is a re real eye opener. Um, and Lynn saying, are you sharing data in areas that are likely to exp extend people's quantity and quality of life versus better managing their, their uh, condition? Um, so yeah, really interesting questions, but I think it's, um, what we, I think it's always been kind of like, what do you, what do you need to know as a patient more than anything from personally being within the system? And that now has to change um, in order to accommodate, you know, better care. Yeah. No, and I, and I agree, Sarah, the first time I heard that life expectancy difference, um, it was shocking, it was upsetting really. Um, and I think that the reason that I've shared that is obviously, um, it's not as simple as you can just move house, but it's that understanding of those wider determinants of health that then actually physically impact on somebody's life expectancy. So why the work with Warrington together is so important that we don't just look at that sharing with health and social care of data. It is bringing in those wider community services. So our volunteers, our church groups, our housing and transport, how that fundamentally over time impacts upon your health. And when we're young, well, I'm middle-aged now, but when I was young, you often don't look at those things within your life, but detrimentally year upon year, those social impacts then impact your health at a later stage. Um, I, th Sorry. I, think I think also um, we've been doing some work with Kate Atherton from Damiboo and she's she's been looking at behaviour change as a big thing um, for, for, for um, how to actually elevate your interventions or your innovations. So for example she was talking about prompts, she was talking about um, keeping your own data and being self-aware and one of the sort of pieces of tech that do it really well is your Fitbit and she was saying how data really shapes our behavior as well so it's not just about treating people based on you know what data we know but it's actually empowering them to have their own data make decisions based on that as well um, you know so I think that's that's really interesting you know the kind of question that comes to my mind is you know how would um, the patients of Warrington um, uh, sort of react or would they improve if they kept their own data off like, you know, for certain things? Um, so yeah, interesting. So if we move on. Yeah, lovely. Um, so as you say, it is around um, supporting people themselves, Carla, to make that change as well. Um, so in Warrington, we had the central, um, which is unfortunately our most deprived area within Warrington, um, and also the West um, integrated teams co-located. Um, as part of that process, we looked at developing a um, it's very health terminology, but a operational procedure. Um, so it's literally just um, agreement of a flow chart, a process that people across the system signed up to. And very much as part of that operating um, procedure was the um, approach for people to take that responsibility themselves. So looking at that behavior change, but looking at, I think somebody wrote earlier in the chat, not just around that quantitative data, but around the qualitative data as well. Um, because what we often can get misled with around data is that we can look at crude data that taken out of context doesn't always give us the true picture. Um, and as we probably all know on this call, a number of that sustainability of that behavior change takes, they say, roughly around a third of that time that that behavior has been embedded as well so what we're not going to do is sustainably change that behavior overnight when people have possibly been living very chaotic lifestyles um, for the last 10-15 years it's going to take a number of years to change that behavior in a sustainable way as well mm -hmm. 
So as part of the um, process in Warrington and some of that um, data sharing barrier, we looked at it very differently. Um, I am a very glass half full person and we looked at it as a bit of an um, opportunity really to make sure that when we were sharing that information, we were also including that person at the true centre. So we developed a system-wide case management plan. Um, and it was very much developed um, with the person, um, the um, health, social, the third sector voluntary service, and they very much kind of owned this support plan. Um, now, we did have the opportunity to work with a number um, of the people in the population with some of the work that Warrington was looking at as part of the transport redesign and housing redesign. Um, and what people told us was they didn't want a big passport of health. What they wanted was something very quick, very simple, that had that um, almost like an algorithm. So a step by step who they could contact and that they didn't have to keep telling their story again and again. So as part of that process, we did develop this case management plan. And in the case management plan is that it's some health issues um, that we talk about. So we um, document people's medication, things like that. But it includes a much wider um, around those third sector voluntary services as well. So are they known to the local church group? Do they have a neighbour who's a key person? Um, mm. Does a neighbour look put out their bin? So those softer things that we were including the community into looking at. And then um, what we looked at in part of response to COVID as well, so very much building on part of this development work with um, that integrated working, was um, if anything, it helped us pick up that pace and volume of working virtually. So I know Carla's just referenced it, but um, the very much initially was that drive with integrated working around e-consult, around working with virtual um, team meetings. If anything positive, not that I'd wish COVID or the current pandemic on anybody, but if anything at the moment, what we have enabled within Warrington is that um, wider use of um, information technology and also assisted technology as well for people. So our most vulnerable who are socially isolating at the moment, um, we've utilised some of that assisted technology tech as well around how we can um, support people, how we can um, really make a difference and still come round a table, but just a very different virtual table. What we plan to do, um, as we are all aware on this call because of winter coming, is very much looking at picking up pace and volume in this second um, wave as well now and looking at supporting that use of technology and moving forward specifically with I know the next speakers around the shared care record and um, so specifically looking at that data around um, the shared care record and how we can support that. And that's me <laughs> very quickly. Um, but yeah, I hope that was useful. Has anyone got any questions? I think that was um, really useful, actually, Sarah. And I think that it, um, it's fantastic to see that it's actually working, but also um, realistic to know that, you know, it's took two years in, in the sort of making and it's still where it, where it is. It's developed further, but it's not, as you say, perfect just yet. I've got a couple of questions really about um, how, was, um, how did you break down those cultural barriers between, um, you know, you said that you had these transitional sessions with them where everybody came what did those look like yeah so um very much around the change cycle really so the transformational events are kind of an, an on, ongoing event really that we continually have and um, with our key stakeholders um also included in that key stakeholders is obviously our population and our people's panel um that is very supportive across warrington um so some of the sessions are very storming um, which is good because um, we have that trust in relationship now that we can be open and honest um, and I, I'm very key when I um, chair those transformational events and deliver them that we do get that open and honesty out there. Um, I think 
the comment around the two years is that this is a continual um, development and COVID in a way has helped us with picking up that pace and volume but what we need to do is make sure that that work especially linking in with our communities um, continues there is a drive as I can see from some of the comments earlier as well that um, some of that funding stream as well as a system um, comes along which often comes out in those transformational events that people are aware of innovation and I mean some of our voluntary and third sector um, organizations have been so forward thinking around supporting our most vulnerable supporting our communities building that up and i think that's what we need to take forward um, as part of this process and integrated working and not see that governance and um, information sharing as a barrier but see how we can really move forward with that um, so Lynn's asked a question, um, when will we ask the patients for their permission to share data with trusted partner organisations, reverse the telescope perhaps? Yeah, so um, that's a good comment Lynn really and um, often what we do is we often um, think that patients don't want to share their information. Um, but often what we find is when we um, initially engaged two years ago, 18 months, two years ago, um, people were actually shocked that we don't share information. Um, and my parents are a prime example of that. My parents live 120 miles down the motorway and my dad still thinks to this day that I can book his flu jab in the local GP surgery because I can just log on to my system. Um, so often it's changing that mindset and having that conversation and that understanding of why are we sharing that information and that we don't share the information inappropriately. Um, one of the good things around the case management plan was that that was their case management plan, they held that. Um, so people would um, develop the case management um, plan themselves and they would keep a copy of that case management plan at home um, which linked in really well with our um, Northwest Ambulance Service as well who were linked in with the case management plan because often what we find when we look at our most vulnerable people that are admitted to hospital and then become our long length of stays is that initially when somebody goes in we all know it's four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and we can't get hold of anybody. We don't know that wraparound of care that people have to um, allow them to live as independently as possible at home. Thanks very much. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there's a comment, Carla, on there from Heather, um, and that is a really good comment. Um, to me, um, public engagement isn't a tick box and I think if anything um, we have a lot of learning and further development around public engagement. I think um, the day we say we've achieved public engagement is the day that we've not really understood what public engagement means. Um, so I think again that's a continual process working with our population, yeah. working yeah. with our members of the public. Um, sorry. No, that's that's great. Yeah, I've just um I brought Debbie in. Debbie is our um patient and public involvement lead. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to um for Debbie to to add that what you've written, Deb. There you go. I should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's quite timely, really, because the um the innovation agency have published my blog about data sharing on the Connected Health Cities project today. So Connected Health Cities, most of you know, was a project that's um, just finished, but we've run it for about four and a half years. And as patient involvement lead, I've been engaging with the public. And Sarah's right, most of the public thought the NHS was a big connected organisation, and it comes as quite a surprise to them. Um, lots are more educated now, and some, I mean, it's um, a legal requirement that they have access to their GP healthcare records. Some still don't know that and don't know how to access it. it so it's really important. And with COVID, I'm part of the Cypher Governance Board as well, which is COVID data sharing. So it's really important that people know the National Op Data Opt-Out Scheme was a prime example that was um, released by the Caldercott Guardians 
was it two years ago, just over two years ago, and lots of people opted out because they thought, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to share my data. But it was actually sharing your data for direct care and they didn't understand that. So people were wondering why it was becoming more disconnected. So education is key in the data sharing. Um, and there's, there was a clear divide between patients and public. It, we found that if you're a patient, people will say, take my data, do what you want with it, just stop all the people from suffering the, from whatever condition I've got. But the public will say, you can't have my data, I don't want to share it. But they'll post everything on Facebook, they'll use their Tesco club card. But by the time you get home, they know what you've shopped, your credit card details, and it'll all appear in your favourites for your next shopping basket. So I think um, Sarah's right, education is key, but we can't stop, we've just got to keep going. Mm. And it's interesting because you hear stories from either side, don't you, where patients... Um, can't believe the responsibility they're given as well you know I was um, chatting to um, somebody last week about the fact that you could already reorder your prescriptions on an app and they just couldn't believe it and they thought it was so unsafe to be able to uh, order a repeat prescription they used to handwriting it and posting it into a lockbox on a GP surgery they just couldn't understand how they were able to do that so there is a um, pace is a really important thing as you say and um, we're not all as fast as each other um, you know, and it's important to make sure that people are caught up with that. But as Lynn says, you know, that's a that's a very difficult thing because you, you have to have that time to build relationships and they have to be meaningful and trustworthy. You need to build that relational trust with people in order for them to allow you to do new new things, change things for them. Um, um, so I know, yeah, so <laughs> I love Lynn's contribution, they're brilliant. Um, a question for Debbie actually, Connected Health Cities had a respiratory component. Um, did you have very much input with this? She'd welcome a conversation. Yeah, COPD was one of our pathways and we worked across COPD and there's new dashboards that Liverpool University worked on for respiratory. So um, Kelly, yes, I'll happy i've put my email in the chat if anyone wants to contact me yeah and i think that uh, thanks debbie and i think that goes back again lynn is saying you know but kind of care home or order a repeat prescription without having an nhs email address you know but again it goes to pace not only so we sort of see this as a bit of a venn diagram really so if you imagine the person or the patient or the colleague as being ready whether your organization is ready and whether the system is ready all of those things have to um, be aligned in order to move forward with innovation whether it's sharing patient data whether that's using one system or another and um, all of those things have to be aligned don't they the person has to be ready your organization has to be ready and the system has to be ready as well and that's kind of what happens isn't it when when it doesn't work i have got another question for you as well sarah i think that um it, it's it's really exemplary the work that, that's been um happening within um within warrington together and um, my question is what impact have you seen on the patient um, since this work has begun in, in general or maybe there might be some particular um, things that you can uh, think about that it, it's enabled what changes you've seen has come about integrated working because you're obviously working right there at the front of it um, what have you actually seen that's changed I mean one of the main benefits um, to patients and to the population of Warrington has been that um, more streamlined of services and um, fundamentally that avoidance of um, admission to hospital. Um, one of the, I suppose, golden threads that we're very lucky with in Warrington is our third sector and voluntary services. And we've really seen um, an involvement with health and social care. So our statutory partners working differently with some of our services that often I have to say hands up even as a district nurse for those many years I didn't even know existed and um, so that true change of place based and delivering that care um, to people within their own communities I would say has been one of the benefits um, However, I do have a little saying around it's often about going slow to go fast um, in the end. So it's about making sure that we really invest in understanding our communities first, understanding what is it that people want um, to be delivered differently across the system rather than 
historically what we perhaps have done is been very, very quick at um, presenting project plans, presenting business cases. Um, and what we don't do is listen to our communities and our public engagement around what is frustrating to them and then how can we adapt and amend those services um, to support that patient journey. I suppose um, the last thing that I'd like to ask really is if um, you know our participants or maybe um, we, we know that a few of them would like to engage with certain areas um, to share information, to share data, to help the um, you, you know to help each other out. What what's the first step that they would need to kind of take if they wanted to embark on something like this, a project like this? I think first of all it's um listening to the communities so i would say um one of the key things is around that relationship building and understanding each other's challenges um bringing people well i'd say bringing people around the table but bringing people at the moment around that virtual table um yeah because often what we find is um and I think I referenced it earlier is we often think we can't do things when there's no reason why we can't do it. And um, especially in health, I have to say we're very good um, at saying no, we can't share that data. No, we can't do it when actually we, we can do it. And um, our patients and our population are very eager for us to share information. So I'd say the key is around relationships, starting to get to know people around your communities, those key stakeholders. Um, and one of the key things I would say is um, get to know those people who truly buy into the same vision and values and mindset, um, those enablers, um, rather than trying to look at those barriers first so looking at how we can build on those enablers and those positive thinking stakeholders mm -hmm. that's really helpful so i'm just going to give the next last five minutes for anybody that's got any more questions for sarah it's been really great to have you um and you've just recently won, won award for warrington together as well haven't you another award i'm sure you i'm sure i've seen something on twitter wasn't it nominated for I know the um, Warrington Hospital has been nominated for their innovation um, around the response to COVID. So um, just a little plug then if anybody would like to um, vote. Um, but yeah, their innovation around the response to COVID has been phenomenal. And what, what, what is that, Sarah? What, does that, what have they listed as, as part of it being successful? Um, so their um, well, their, their mortality rates. So um, they responded to um, those. I don't know if anybody's seen it in the news, but um, the response to Warrington was very forward thinking around the use of the CPAP machine rather than um, full ventilation um, with those patients who were um, obviously in ITU and um, in the first phase of COVID. Um, and their mor mortality rates have massively reduced, um, and obviously people's um, response and recovery period um, has increased from that which we can see in the flow around the system of Warrington Hospital um, I'm touching wood at the moment with this second phase um, but hopefully if people are sensible and follow the guidelines then um, we won't see another peak. Mm -hmm. Lovely so any more questions for Sarah before we will wrap up a bit earlier? You can raise your hand if you'd like to actually chat rather than type it in the chat. I can see that and then I can unmute you. I suppose just one, one final question for me then, Sarah, is where do you see this going now in terms of digitalising? Because I could see that being maybe digitalised, that patient record, like where do you see this going? Yeah, and I think there are so many opportunities, um, especially from COVID, as I say, because of that use of um, apps. Um, the key principles to me and those values are the same around the um, inclusion of technology, but around that ownership. So people really taking um, ownership of their own health and social care needs. Um, I mean, apps are coming up all the time, aren't they? When you talk about um, apps so around like the Fitbit, um, I am addicted to my my zone. So met points. Um, in fact, I um, went to the gym the other day to train and I'd forgot my MyZone band, so I had to drive back home to do it. I couldn't possibly train without having it on. <laughs> um, but it is around that ownership and that true difference that it makes um, 
unfortunately now I'm middle-aged I can't afford to not start making a difference to my own health um, but yeah, I just think the opportunities and that's sharing as well. So opportunities like today, thank you to everybody for um, joining the call and inviting me today. But that networking, sharing um, good practice and also sharing some of the things that maybe didn't go as well. Um, so we don't go down the same route um, mm -hmm. is a really good opportunity now.